This episode of Instant Analysis is brought to you by Platinum Storage Group and Real Estate Investments. For uscfootball.com, I'm Keely Yor here with Dan Weber for instant analysis of day 18 of the Todd McNair NCAA trial. And today was kind of the culmination of the trial. We got to hear the closing arguments from both sides of the case. Um, it definitely was an interesting day. I think everyone was on, on the edge of their seats and all of the seats are taken on, in the small courtroom. So it was an interesting day for sure. But let's start off chronologically with Bruce Brolette, Todd McNair's lawyer. Uh, he kind of came out of the gates with what we talked about in last, uh, last incident analysis. We talked about they need to make the motive clear if you're Tom McNair. Why would the Committee on Infractions pin this on Tom McNair? What is the motive? Why is there malice in this case? And how did he set up that argument? He did it, you know, like he always does with a smile and kind of, you know, softly and uh, made a great, you know, just his opening with the jury. I mean, he just, he says good morning and they give him a good morning back like they're, you know, third graders. Good morning to, you know, and he's just, he has a great rapport. It was kind of, uh, a very personal sort of a thing, uh, but he really made it clear that uh, basically the NCA did have a motive. The motive was that uh, uh, they could not really give a lack of institutional control uh, finding against USC and give them 30 scholarships and two-year bowl ban if they didn't find one single USC person guilty. I mean, it's not, you couldn't have walked away from there and said, yeah, that's a fair, and so he basically said they had to tie it to Todd McNair. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of penalty they gave Todd McNair. They had to say a USC staff person, a USC coach, knew about it and didn't and lied about it and was guilty of unethical conduct. And, um, and, and that's the problem for Todd McNair is he's tied with the most famous case, most famous. And, and of course, the NCAA keeps saying, oh, there are a lot of famous cases, blah, blah, blah. No, the, the most famous, the most high profile case in uh, modern NCA history and uh, and he's the only person the only name attached to it and that's why he's had a different situation when they say well other guys have had you know one year show causes or whatever uh, and they you know survive and they go but they aren't attached to the biggest case in uh, in modern college football history or college sports history so I think he really attached it why it hurt why it hurt Todd why they had to do it with Todd and as much as the NSA has gone after him on that point, he basically said, uh, we have the evidence. Now, the NCA has a bunch of people who say, no, 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 it, that wasn't the case. That wasn't, they've got people denying, 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 and basically in the same word. Whereas Bruce says, we have the evidence. Here were the penalties, six scholarships, one year bowl ban before they found Todd McNair guilty. And here are the penalties, 30 scholarships and a two year bowl ban after they found him guilty. And the NCA came up with a, the most ridiculous explanation that they've really ever tried to get anybody to believe was that, well, they just, they were gonna enhance those penalties and the chairman, Paul D, wanted it to be a TV ban, which nobody takes seriously, including their own Committee on Infractions person, Brian Halloran, who testified in this case, that, nah, we didn't take that seriously. No one did. So if, uh, so all they, you know, today, basically they could say, well, the NCA would say, yes, maybe these were the penalties before. And then the Todd McNair verdict was decided, and then these were the penalties after. But just because that happened in the timeline between the one set of penalties and the other, that doesn't mean there was causation for those, uh, for the Todd McNair verdict to cause those uh, higher penalties and one would be left sitting there thinking well then what was did they have an explanation uh they did not yeah you mentioned the rapport that bruce brulet has with the jury um i thought it was interesting how he made it a point to empower the jury he said the world of sports in america is watching you to see how you vote to see if you hold the NCAA accountable for vo violating the rules. He went on to say that the NCAA forces, um, uh, enforces all these rules that they make, but when they have an agenda, they bend the rules, they break the rules to their will. So it was interesting how he kind of removed the veil about this is a big case. This is something that the NCAA is going to have to either learn from um, depending on if they award damages. So it was interesting how he empowered the jury in that way. Yeah, I thought that's a good word, empowered him. And he said basically, uh, you can't let the people who make the rules, who enforce the rules, who tell everybody else 
they have to obey the rules and then they themselves choose not to obey the rules. He said, you can't let them do that. Not just the NCA, but anywhere. You know, the people that, you know, uh, make the rules have to be held accountable to, to abide by the rules. I thought he said something else in his final close where he got to come back later in the afternoon and he said to these people, he said, and he compared it to voting. He said in voting, uh, you know, elections have consequences and in voting, you're one of millions. He said, but in a case like this, you're, a, you're one in 12. And he said, in this case, you will always be Todd McNair's jury. And that was very, very late in the, in the day. And uh, I thought that was an interesting way to leave it with the jury. You will always be Todd McNair's jury. Mm -hmm. Moving on to Kostas Stogoyevich's uh, arguments that he made. He got 20 minutes before we took our lunch break and then got uh, pretty much the rest of the afternoon to make his arguments. Uh, one of the main arguments he made is that in regards to def defamation, only three documents should be considered for those claims. And uh, the first one is the findings report that the Committee on Infractions made in regards to Todd McNair and the whole USC case. Um, and then it was the uh, Infractions Appeals Committee and their findings report, which is essentially just a recopy of the first. Uh, they only quoted things from the first findings report. And then a USA Today report where president of the NCAA, Mark Emmert, said, I think that they, the committee got it right pretty much. Something that's not a direct quote, but he said that. So he was saying for def defamation, those three documents should uh, be considered, not the private emails that Shep Cooper, Rod, Rod Alpoff, and Roscoe Howard sent to each other, just those three documents. Well, I think uh, with the Emmert situation, he said it before the appeals committee yes, had uh, made its decision. So, uh, and I, they said, well, you don't have any proof that any of these people even heard about his statement. And you think, wait a minute, these are four people on the Committee on Infractions who have risen to this high place in the, in, in the world of the NCAA, and the incoming president is now giving his verdict on a case that they are going to be hearing and they're not paying any attention to it, that really, you know, strains credulity, I think, at, at this point. They're just uh, probably not exactly believable. But there were a decent number of moments today that weren't necessarily believable, you know, and you've got some leeway, uh, you know, in the closing arguments. And, you know, it was mostly the NCA pointing at Bruce and saying, you know, you let that man get away with saying this about us, and we want you to tell him not to do that. And the judge said, yeah, no. No, sorry, not going to do that. Yeah, Costa also argue, argued that the plaintiff has uh, the whole in their, their story as wide as the Grand Canyon in regards to the motive. Why would uh, the committee do this to Todd McNair? Um, how do you think that, that that went down to the jury? Well, I mean, I think Bruce did give him a motive. You know, I, I just think the idea that, you know, there's a big hole in the case, uh, Bruce said, here it is. Here's the evidence. Here were the penalties before. Here were the penalties after. That's the evidence. And, and, and he said, of course, they're not going to admit what they did. I mean, you can talk to them all day. They're not going to say, yeah, we did it. No. I mean, I thought he made that gave him a chance, I think, to make that point. Like, you really expected somebody in the committee to say, hey, this is what we did. We're just not going to tell you. No, they're not going to tell you. But to have the documentation that says, this is what they were going to do before. This is when it happened to McNair. And it took them, I mean, uh, Costa now today was saying it took them four months. Why did it take them four months? They, they walked out of Tempe, Arizona after the hearing saying they had most of the uh, decisions about USC and everything else all finalized. So it sure looks like the only thing that took them four months was the Todd McNair decision. And why did they fight so hard? to tie Todd McNair uh, into the USC case. And one would think that they needed to get the penalties from six scholarships to 30 scholarships. And they felt like the only way they could do that was to nail something to a USC person. And that person, unfortunately, because he was Reggie Bush's coach, uh, was Todd McNair. It was interesting because Costa kind of explained it as a conspiracy theory. Why would eight people on the committee come from different walks of life and then decide to go after USC? And he kind of he also said that, well, look at we brought them to the witness stand. Look at the witnesses. Why, why would they do something like that? So I think there's a little bit of lack of self-awareness of how some of the NCAA witnesses came off to the jury. Um, 
And then I think it points to the greater point of this case. It comes down to who's more credi credible, who does the jury like more, Tom McNair or those NCAA witnesses. Well, and too, to say, and these people are volunteers and they give up all this time. And, you know, I mean, why would a person in Nebraska or Philadelphia in the middle of January, why would they go on an all expense paid trip to Tempe, Arizona? Oh, I don't know. I mean, why do you think they would do that? Uh, and so, I mean, I mean, thinks they, you know, made the case way too much that these are, you know, volunteers who are just trying to do the right thing. I think Todd, I uh, mean, uh, Bruce also made an interesting point. He said, this is like the most important case the NCAA has done. They've admitted it's the most complex. It's the most contentious. Uh, he said they had four brand new people, basically. He said they had greenhorns. I mean, you know, and then they dropped Petuto in. Uh, the most experienced one, and she had an axe to grind. Obviously, she had already made up her mind about Lloyd Lake's credibility, the guy running the committee in terms of the, uh, uh, you know, the NCAA staff's part of it. Shep Cooper had already said he believes Lloyd Lake. You had Paul D. as the chairman who was bound and determined to get the, uh, you know, he had had uh, the Miami rogue outlaw, whatever you want to call that program, and he was embarrassed that they were probably uh, had gotten the worst penalties in NCAA history. Did he have a motive to get USC's penalties above that? He certainly mentioned that the next day, I mean, the, the day of the press conference when they announced the uh, decision in the USC case, he mentioned that the USC penalties surpassed the Miami penalties. He was kind of aware of that. So, you know, it was, uh, and so, so Bruce kind of called him out today, I think, in terms of, what Petuto wanted and what uh, um, uh, what Paul D more you know wanted and what the and it was interesting it was a battle of visuals to some extent yeah. when Costa comes up first thing he does throws up a big slide of the eight members of the committee on infraction and they're kind of looking down at the jury and of course the three people whose testament whose uh, evidence there is by far the most uh, the coordinator Chef Cooper coordinator of, of appeals. Uh, Rodney Uphoff and the uh, observer and another non-voting member. So the three non-voting members by far, because of all the emails and all the things they said about Todd, have been by f way more a part of this uh, uh, case, this lawsuit, than the others who are up on the screen. And you know, if you're a member of the, you know, the jury, you're looking at it and you're saying, well, they don't have any of the pictures up there of the three people who we've been talking about for three weeks. Uh, so I don't know how that plays. I mean, I yeah. just know that they know those people really had a lot to do with this case. And the NCAA says, ah, no, they're just, they're just side issues. That doesn't even, you know, don't pay any attention. <laughs> you know, what is it? Don't pay any attention to the guy behind the screen. Uh, you know, don't pay any attention to those guys sitting over in the corner. You know, one of the more initially uh, convincing arguments that Costa made was he put out a whole screen of people that, uh, McNair's lawyers could have called to the stand that would have corroborated Tom McNair's story, like Reggie Bush, Pete Carroll, someone from USC. Um, there's a whole list of them, but he said he kind of counted it against McNair's lawyers for only relying on McNair for his testimony. But in his rebuttal, uh, Bruce Rollette kind of turned it around Costa and he That's said, right. I called my star witness, Tom McNair. I had my star witness. You didn't have your star witness, Lloyd Lake. You didn't call him. And then he turned to the jury and, was, and said, well, why, don't, why didn't they call uh, Lloyd Lake because nobody believes Lloyd Lake. So it was an interesting turnaround of, oh, yeah, they didn't call Lloyd Lake. Yeah, that's good lawyering. To yeah. be able to, that's that, you know, jujitsu principle where you take their best shot and you turn it around on them. Because obviously Lloyd Lake is their key witness. He's the one that without him, they have no findings against Todd and they couldn't have made up uh, a case against Todd. They needed Lloyd Lake. Lloyd Lake was there for a reason. They even played Lloyd Lake, we, I mean, I don't think many of us have heard that. They even played the uh, uh, interview with Lloyd yeah. Lake from the NCA. We had not heard that. Uh, we got to hear Lloyd Lake. We heard uh, that earlier in the trial. Did we hear that? Yeah. We did? Yeah. We actually heard that interview, that whole we interview? We did. I, I totally missed it. I'm <laughs> typing, I guess. Uh, uh, I remember reading it. I did never remember hearing it. And so it, it focused my attention on it. Uh, and I, I thought it didn't. Then they said, basically, when we changed the words around, it sort of matched up with what he said. But they had to admit, 
they put it in there and then they said, well, we weren't putting in his exact words. We weren't putting in a transcript. We weren't, we were, you were paraphrasing it. And uh, I'm not sure how well that played with the jury because, you know, they had a couple of things that, um, that he said that they were, you know, happy that he said, uh, but they also had him saying, yeah, McNair made the call and yeah, he made a couple of calls to uh, McNair, you know, and they weren't true. I mean, and they, he, you know, he was saying things in that interview that absolutely flat out were not true. And they said, we find him credible. I, again, that's probably one of those things that uh, it's really hard to get people to say they believe that. Yeah. One of the more odder parts of the day, or at least of Costa's argument, was he kind of antagonized Bruce Burlett. Um, he even had him in some of the slides of, well, counsel said this, um, don't believe him, he, you can't believe what he said. So I thought it was interesting to go after Burlett like that, especially when it's obvious that the jury has a rapport with uh, Burlett. Point. Why would you go after him? It's an interesting s strategy. I don't know if it necessarily worked, but it, it was definitely a little odd. <laughs> Look mean. He made himself look mean. He was, and he was trying hard. I mean, you had to be a lip reader sometimes to be able to tell what uh, Costa was saying, because he was he had someone somewhere he coached himself or somebody coached him and said, you know, speak real softly and just write to the jurors, and you couldn't hear him, uh, you know, back in the, you know, anywhere where anybody was sitting. Uh, and I know you said that some of their lawyers were looking like, what's he doing? Uh, but um, he was trying. I mean, it's hard. I think if you're in the courtroom and you're with somebody like Bruce Broilett, that's a hard place to be, especially if you don't have any of that ability maybe to connect with the jury. Uh, and so he, uh, he kind of went after Bruce a little bit. And then Bruce, he kind of got Bruce's uh, attention there at the end. And Bruce kind of came back. And that was, that was good to see. I enjoyed it. That was really worth seeing. Yeah, the interesting thing is that uh, Burlett was pretty even keeled throughout the whole trial. He was a little angry at w during some witnesses, um, but pretty much calm. But then he was he had passion today. He was fired up when talking about Todd McNair. And I think that helped him in the case that, OK, if he's fired up for this, we got to listen. At least if you're the jury it, if, and you have a report with him, OK, he's fired up about this. It, it must be worth listening to. And I thought it, I didn't think it was a necessarily a winning argument when uh, Costa said, all they've got is Todd McNair, and and Bruce said that's who the case is about. I mean, he, we put him on under oath to talk about all of this. And who did you put on? You know, who did you put on? You put on people basically who you know kind of had to uh, hew to the NCA's line. I mean, they they did what they did, and they basically had to say that they did it right, and they didn't mean any bad things, and they kept denying I mean you have all these emails from these three volunteer or these three uh, observers who are not supposed to be in the deliberations and it's obvious they're in the deliver deliberations and they kept saying no they're not in there and they didn't affect us and blah 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 well you know they wanted to believe that but um, you know I mean I know Petito would say nobody can make me you know believe anything that I, you know I just believe what I believe and uh, and Myers wants to be the smartest person in the room so she's not gonna let anybody uh, influence her but something happened between the time they started deliberating and the time they finished up deliberating. Yeah. The time they started in February, time they ended up in, in, uh, in June, something happened. What happened? And these guys were, who were trying to influence the um, committee were very worried about it, as they said over and over and over again, that it wasn't going the right way. And they had to start making their points. And, and uh, they were worried and they were worried. And we have no explanation from anybody other than Eleanor Myers said, well, she just needed to see the transcript and that took a month and then that's all, that answered all her questions. Well, obviously, you know, that couldn't possibly be the case uh, because they went two more months after that. So it wasn't like the transcript solved her problem. And we got no answer as to why the other people weren't coming along with them. We also didn't, you know, again, no answer as to who wrote the, um, uh, the final report yeah. Was there a vote or wasn't there a vote? We don't, know. we don't know. And the NCAA didn't even, you know, try to answer those questions. I mean, when they were, it was interesting when they were trying to say, well, Bruce didn't do this and, they, you know, McNair's uh, side, you know, case didn't answer this or didn't bring this person up. They didn't try to even begin to explain um, some of that. They just, they just didn't go there. Mm -hmm. Okay, final question, because I know we're going long. It was a big day, but uh, uh, it's a jury trial. 
jury trials are interesting because you never really know what they're going to take out of this, what, what resonated with them. I'm very curious. I want to interview them soon. Um, I think if it was a judge trial, it would be much easier for the decision, but there's 12 people and nine of them need to be conv convinced one way or the other. <laughs> what's your best guess of what's going to happen? You know, it's kind of like if you sent me to the, you know, go to the ballet tomorrow and do a play by play, you know, that would, that would be about my ability. Uh, I mean, you know, yeah, everybody who, who, you know, goes to a lot of trials, you, you know, they keep telling you, man, a jury trial, you just don't know. Yeah. Uh, and so for me to act like I, I know what, what those folks are thinking, I'm not, not going there. Uh, and, you know, is this the jury where one person is really going to have the ability to influence them because he's the, you know, really, uh, you know, guy that's got it all together or whatever? I don't know. But, uh, uh. I'm not even going to make a prediction other than I guess we'll be here at 9 o'clock uh, uh, Monday morning. They're going to get some five minutes, ten minutes, whatever, worth of instruction. And then they're going to go to the jury room. And they're supposed to have all the, you know, the big binders of all the approved material is going to be in that jury room. And, and I think they said for the third parties who were in interested and what have you, they were going to give us 15 minutes notice and they said and, and maybe a half hour by telephone or something like that so uh i don't think we're going to be able to stay home and yeah. wait for the call uh i think we're i think we have to be here yep. uh and different estimates i've seen one day they're gonna and four days uh so i don't know and i don't know if that means counting the four days is they figure up damages if they're you know are are them uh, are, you know are there going to be are, are, are damages uh, I do know this, uh, one of the things that kept happening today was that Costa kept saying, if I'm a third of the lawyer, because there's like six or seven questions, they have to answer yes, and then if they get the yes on the first one, they go to the second one, and they have to keep answering yes. And he kept saying things like, well, if I'm the third of the lawyer, they won't get to question three. And if I'm a tenth of the lawyer, they will not get to question five or six or whatever. But he did. He went to every one of the questions. He answered them all, and so did Bruce. They both went, um, you know, through the questions and how the jury needs to be able to answer these questions. And uh, I probably found it easier to answer yes to Bruce's questions than uh, no to Costa's questions. But uh, we know a whole lot more about this case. Yeah. Uh, so how how you can put yourself in, in somebody else's shoes? I don't know. I, yeah. I really, I can't even begin. I mean, I would, I've said this before. I would say, if you said 10 of those 12 jurors had never heard the term NCAA before uh, they got on this jury, I would say that's probably true. And when I say that to other people, they say, yeah, that sounds about right. So how do you, you know, this is asking them to come up with a decision about something that's so far out of their world of experience. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know either. I guess we'll see. We'll be camped out here. We'll give you the, the verdict as soon as we know. But that's going to wrap it up for day 18, closing arguments for the Todd McNair NCAA trial. For Dan Weber, I'm Keely Orr. For more, check out uscfootball.com.